This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Well, tonight we're welcoming Gareth Milroy for his maybe third <laughs> performance here, mm. if not more than that. So he's, he's, he's one of our regulars and he's going to be speaking about the joys of, of vac- vaccination and public health and what happens when people don't like what you're, they're supposed to be doing medically. So, to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I, I should probably start with the usual caveats of um, this is a work in progress and is part of a wider project and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to sort of talk about this today was because there's a lot going on with this story that I'm going to tell and I would rather that you told me what was interesting and then I went away and did that rather than do the work myself. So, um, this, this talk will be about uh, medical negligence, the rights of patients, how the public reacts to notions of risk, political campaigning, voluntarism, which is good because that's why we're here, disability, the social security system, and quite a lot else as well. Um, and the main focus is on what has been called the pertussis vaccine scare of the 1970s and the early 1980s. And more specifically, I'm going to be talking about this, which is the Vaccine Damage Payments Act 1979, and how it came to pass through Parliament following a concerted campaign by the Association of Parents of Vaccine Damaged Children, who have a very catchy name. Uh, This piece of legislation provides payments to the families of children who had become 80% or more disabled following vaccines given as part of the government's vaccination programme. And that definition in itself is quite interesting, and I'll come on to that. Uh, in due course. Um, But there's a lot to unpack because I'm coming at this really from two distinct angles. The first is from my PhD work which was on disability benefits in the late 20th century and I gave a talk on that here a few years ago which is still available on the website if you click now. And uh, that immediately raised questions in my mind about how disability is assessed, why vaccine damaged children were considered a special group and how this got passed in an era of restricted government spending. The second comes from my current work on the construction of the public within British public health. I'm working with Alex Mould, who will be here next week, at the Centre for History and Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, LSHTM. And my my specific role as her research monkey is to look at vaccine policy and the role of the public in massive scare quotes. So in this respect, why did the Association of Parents of Vaccine Damaged Children, hereafter the association, why did they gain so much support from the press and from the public. Why were the public scared or panicked about vaccines at this time? How did the government react to contain this public relations problem? Did they rely on politics or science or on something else? And questions of that nature. So that's basically why I'm here today and I'm hoping that your feedback will help me find out really what other people find interesting and important about this because I can go in so many different directions and I think it'd be good to perhaps sort of narrow that focus down a little bit. So, um, 90s reference. So, what about, what what is this about? Well, it's, the the pertussis vaccine scare was about uh, the DTP vaccine. So, pertussis, or whooping cough, is a childhood disease that has caused great distress to sufferers and those who care for them. It can last a number of weeks, during which patients can cough so hard that they vomit or even break ribs. It's not nice. And moreover, while most children recover, it can be deadly. In 2013, there were around 60,000 deaths worldwide. A vaccine was introduced in the 1940s and was merged with the vaccines for diphtheria and tetanus in Britain in 1957, creating a triple vaccine called DTP. Since that point, pertussis cases and uh, pertussis deaths have declined, and more on those statistics in a minute. In 1974, three doctors at Great Ormond Street Hospital, the renowned children's hospital, alleged a link between the pertussis vaccination and brain damage. And this sparked a debate about both the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine. While the majority of medical opinion remained convinced about the benefits, there were enough credible dissenting voices which emerged to make parents anxious. The press latched onto the story and began to openly question the vaccination programme and whether the risks to children were acceptable. And again, more on that as we go along. Campaigners argued that while injuries may indeed be rare, the government did not do enough to advise parents on the potential risks. 
In particular, vaccines should not be given to children who present with certain symptoms or have specific medical histories, also known as contraindicators. And they argued that the government had heavily implied that vaccination was a risk-free procedure, when instead it should have better advised parents and doctors about the possible side effects. The result was a massive drop-off in the number of children being presented for DTP. In 1972, 79% of children under the age of two had been vaccinated against whooping cough. By 1976, only 38% of children who, had been, who were under the age of two had been. And for comparison, um, in 1972, 81% had been vaccinated against diphtheria and tetanus, um, which went down to 75%, um, meaning and heavily implying that, um, children, that parents were scared about tussies in particular and going out and getting the specific individual vaccines for diphtheria and tetanus. And polio, which was a, obviously a different disease, uh, went down from 80% to 74%. So while there was a decline in support for vaccination as a result of the scare, um, it was um, most dramatically concentrated on pertussis. Knowing that the life cycle of the disease tended to provide epidemics every three to four years, this became a worry for the government and for the Medical Research Council. And the government's advisers told them, that, uh, told them and the press that the likelihood was that it would be a larger than normal epidemic in 1978-79. And they were correct. So this table comes from a paper by um, Barker, who's one of the few people that's written a sort of a history uh, of this scare. Now, DTP was introduced in 1957. I hope that's clear enough for people to, uh, to see. Um, and from the data, it becomes clear that um, once the vaccination became routine, not only was the base number of in infections down, the three-year spikes were also much lower than the variations we see in the 1940s and early 1950s. Following the scare and the lower vaccination rate, the, the epidemics of 78, 79 and 82, 83 were much worse than they had been in previous years. And interestingly, uh, the death rate actually remained reasonably static, but I'm not, um, I'm not an expert on the disease to be able to say um, why that was necessarily the case. But once the vaccination rate did recover, uh, the notification for the disease declined back to pre-scare levels, um, which, which implies that the scare was um, resolved and vaccination was kept as a, as a uh, thing and uh, children who are born in this country still receive, for the most part, the DTP. But this isn't really a paper about the epidemiology or whether vaccination really works. Um, that's well outside my comfort zone. What I'm interested in is how this played out in the politi political and, and public realm and for this seminar series, of course, the role of voluntary organisations within that debate. And this is where the association comes in. Now, much of what we know about the group comes from the biography of its leader, Rosemary Fox, and the usual public record places such as the National Archives and the newspapers. Um, the organisation itself doesn't have an archive, but I mean, if anybody is interested in a PhD topic, I think they are a, a very interesting group to, um, to track down and try and find out uh, uh, how they behaved and how other related groups to them did behave. Um, the group was formed by two Midlands mothers, uh, Renee Lennon and Rosemary Fox. Uh, both were based in Stratford-upon-Avon in Warwickshire, and Fox in particular claimed that her daughter Helen, see pictured, had been damaged by a polio vaccination in 1961. They both wrote a letter to the Birmingham Post in 1973 and were interviewed by the same paper, asking if any other parent had had similar experiences, and if so, would they be willing to form a pressure group to get compensation from the government? And as I think most of you in the room will know, that was a reasonably common tactic for uh, these kind of groups in the 1960s and 1970s. It appears to have been successful as by the time their story was picked up by The Guardian in August, there was a formal association and that original Birmingham Post article is uh, reproduced many times in the government file showing they were obviously keeping an eye on, on, this, um, on this topic. Lennon seems to have been um, quickly sidelined but Fox become, becomes the, very much the public face of the campaign and she's the one often writing the, uh, the letters to the press and, uh, and giving interviews. She quickly built a relationship with Jack Ashley, who was a deaf MP and prominent disability campaigner, who had been involved in the Disablement Income Group and had established the All-Party Group on Disablement in the Houses of Parliament, and was the lead, pro pro the, the lead proponent of the thalidomide victims during the Sunday Times campaign over 1973 and 1974. With the February 1974 election resulting in a somewhat victory for Labour, and then the October election um, continuing in that vein, um, Fox then had the opportunity to arrange a meeting with Barbara Castle, who was the Secretary of State for Social Services. 
Uh, Ashley was Castle's um, private parliamentary secretary at the time, and as a result, the association maintained contact with the DHSS, the Department of Health and Social Services, and they maintained those um, those links even after Ashley resigned and Castle was fired and replaced with David Ennels. Aside from direct lobbying, the group also attempted to bring the DHSS to the European Court of Human Rights, arguing that children had effectively been forced into a medical seat procedure without the informed consent of parents. Uh, they didn't succeed in that, but it did raise the profile of the campaign and at least force the DHSS to mount some kind of defence. The pressure eventually culminated in the passage of the Vaccine Damage Payments Act in 1979, although this didn't go anywhere near as far as the association had originally planned. But it was a remarkable piece of legislation. First, it made vaccine damage a special group within the social security system against the trend of benefit reforms for disabled people in 1970 and 1975. Secondly, it went through the House with no debate, being introduced and passed within a matter of weeks. And it managed to get its royal assent a week before Jim Callaghan lost a vote of no confidence in Parliament, and Margaret Thatcher subsequently won the 1979 general election. So let's put this presentation in the context of the 1970s. Now, th no, that's, no, that's vomit. Let's, let's go back. Okay. Some of this perhaps needs to be placed into the context of the 1970s. Now, I don't have time to go into massive detail over this, but I think there are some um, parts that really do put this campaign, um, uh, that really situate this campaign within um, the political framework at the time. Um, first, thalidomide was very much uh, fresh in the memory. In fact, the uh, thalidomide case hadn't really been resolved uh, before we start to get um, issues to do with um, vaccine damage. While the original tra tragedy had occurred at the end of the 1950s, the case had been opened up again after it was clear that compens proper compensation had still not been paid to the victims. The company that had uh, manufactured the drug, Distillers, um, still, hadn't, um, still hadn't paid up, but they were forced to, and a new social security payment for congenitally disabled children was established by Ted Heath and uh, the Secretary of State at the time, Sir Keith Joseph. And it drew public attention to the idea that pharmaceutical companies and the regu regulatory systems could mess up. Related to that, although more distant in the memory, was the Cutter incident of 1955. Shortly after the introduction of the polio vaccine in the United States, a faulty batch of the vaccine was, dis was distributed that infected hundreds of children, um, thousands of children, in fact. Now again, this showed that even if vaccination had been a major success and the public was aware that by this point polio had been virtually eradicated in, a West, in the Western world and vaccination was held up as the reason for that, um, they did realise that individual vaccines by individual suppliers could become contaminated. So there was some risk involved in vaccination. Um, and related to that, we've, we've got, uh, during the 1970s, a, a growing questioning of the power of medical authorities and a sort of a growing realisation that um, regardless of the benefits of biomedicine, the, it wasn't entirely a sort of a positive um, development. Off the back of thalidomide and a number of other reforms to disability legislation, the government had set up a Royal Commission on Civil Liability and Compensation for Personal Injury, also known as the Pearson Committee. It primarily focused on industrial injuries legislation and the possibility of introducing no-fault insurance to provide better compensation for individuals disabled as a result of accidents or negligence. Because of thalidomide, medical negligence and accidents were added to the remit, and this gave campaigners an in because they could argue that vaccine damage constituted medical negligence and they were therefore able to secure a section in the report on vaccination. Again, more on this later. And this has to be placed in the context of wider interest in disability issues. Groups such as the, groups such as the Disablement Income Group the Royal Association for Disability and Rehabilitation and the Disability Alliance had secured extensions to the social security system for disabled people in 1970 and 1975. They were also involved in a number of government projects in the Wilson Callaghan years, including the Committee on Restrictions Against Disabled People and the Motability Scheme for Providing Cars for Disabled Drivers. Part of the reasoning for, re for the restructuring of personal injury compensation came from the arguments that these from these groups about the need for proper financial support for all disabled people, regardless of their cause of impairment. The general rediscovery of poverty, which had sparked these debates, also meant that new groups of disabled people were also discovered. Vaccine damage campaigners were able to slot their children very easily into this rhetoric and consistently argued their case in the language of the disability movement. Again, more of this in a bit. 
And then we have to put this all into the wider context of the late 1970s and the IMF loan, which forced Labour government, which forced the Labour government to restrict expenditure. And uh, after this, in the 1980s, the Thatcher government as well, who um, who also restricted the expenditure. Any plans for exp expanding the groups of disabled people entitled to state support had to be low cost and they had to be heavily restricted. Being a relatively small yet highly visible group, the association had an advantage here, but they had to battle against the prevailing attitude that disabled people should receive compensation based on need and not on the cause of their impairment. Thalidomide at least showed them that special cases could still secure support, but it would be difficult within the economic climate. Okay, after a long and um, slightly rambling introduction, let's get into perhaps some of the uh, arguments that were specifically made by this group and how they made them. Uh, and the place to start, really, I think, is with uh, this editorial, which was in the BMJ in March 1973. It was published on the 31st of March 1973. Now, this was before the association was um, formally introduced, but it does show that these arguments had um, were starting to be made, and that the key part here being that the moral justification for compensation in these circumstances, i.e. people that have been injured um, as a result of vaccination, is based on the social contract. If individuals are asked to accept a risk, even a very small one, partly for the benefit of society, then it seems equitable that society should compensate the victims of un occasional unlucky mishaps, rather um, underplaying perhaps some of the, uh, some of the damage that was, was done at times. And this is important for two reasons, because first it shows that the broad thrust of the association's campaign and of its supporters, that the state ought to compensate those individuals damaged by a policy designed to protect the collective, had already been articulated by medical authorities. And second, it also shows that this rhetoric was not anti-vaccination in the way that we're currently seeing the debate over MMR and other immunisation campaigns, especially in the United States. Rather, it was, a relatively main, it was relatively mainstream to believe both that vaccination was safe, but in the rare instances of damage, the state should compensate, because this small risk and small damage was worth it for, for the national public health in the long run. So, as the association's campaign gathered a bit of pace, um, allies such as Jack Ashley um, didn't argue necessarily for the withdrawal of vaccines and instead they focused on the way in which parental choice had been abused. In 1977 the Parliamentary Commissioner was asked to investigate whether or not the health departments had provided enough information for parents so that they could make informed choices about whether or not to have their children vaccinated. Fox and the Association had, had long made the argument that the DHSS and uh, the health authorities in Scotland had failed to make available to all the information that they should have taken into account before agreeing to have their children vaccinated against whooping cough. Which was, a, which was an, an, interesting, an interesting tactic given that um, Fox herself wasn't actually arguing um, that her child had been damage, damaged by um, pertussis, but the, um, the organisation had made a deliberate choice to focus on this disease because it was the one that was in in the public eye, and it was also the one that most of their members had come to the association saying, this is what's affected my child. Um, so they very much played, um, played into something which had already um, sort of uh, really sort of captured the public consciousness. Um, as, part of, as part of this investigation, they submitted a, a series of test cases where contraindicators had been ignored or where children had become damaged following a vaccination. And while the report did not support the conclusion that there was a cause and effect relationship between vaccination and disability, um, the Commissioner did rule that there, wasn't, there was not enough information given to the parents. And he even accepts perhaps the reasoning that the DHSS did not want to overemphasise a risk which they were advised by their medical experts was remote and they might therefore deter parents from starting protective measures which they had been reliably advised were beneficial i.e. the risk was so small it wasn't worth telling anybody about. But the Commissioner said this didn't apply in the case of contraindicators. More should have been done to make parents and doctors aware of the seriousness of the side effects. And between this Commission starting and, um, and the report, um, the Department had made um, some moves in that direction by providing literature to parents um, and uh, re-advising um, doctors to be aware 
than if a child, for example, um, was having convulsions that they shouldn't be having any more vaccines. Uh, if they had a rash that they should back off and they should make notes so that if they had any siblings that they weren't, um, they weren't vaccinated either. So in concluding his report he argued, I consider that the departments must accept a large measure of responsibility and believe that they should have recognised earlier the desirability of alerting parents, as they have now done. I believe the association had performed a valuable service in bringing this matter to the attention of the public and authorities. So what's very clear here is that although these ideas were around before the association, it does seem to be that the association gets the credit for um, really pushing um, these ideas in the public sphere. Um, and it's very clear that, that Fox was was very active uh, in making sure that she got as wide a support as possible. And with an ally like Jack Ashley, um, it, was, it was very easy to sort of um, to spread the message. This kind of reflected really um, within Parliament. There were a number of early day motions which had been signed by MPs of all parties about the need for a compensation scheme. One from late 1974, which had been signed by over 50 MPs, read that this House is concerned at the lack of statistics concerning vaccine-damaged children, believes that their case for compensation is at least as just as those children suffering as a result of the thalidomide tra tragedy, and demands an immediate investigation into the problem. Which was the other thing that the Association was very good at, at exploiting. The, there were very few statistics on contraindicators or on damage to children partly because it is virtually impossible to prove cause and effect with, with vaccination and, and convulsions. At exactly the same time as a child is likely to develop convulsions, that's the time that we start vaccinating them. So you have a vaccination, within a few days the child has a convulsion, and it's very easy to say that A led to B, even though you know, plenty of studies over time have sort of tried to account for that and haven't been able to find a link. Um, but that didn't stop. Uh, obviously didn't stop parents being very concerned that there was, a, there was a real risk to their children. And the association was very good at sort of saying, well, whether we're right or whether we're wrong, you can't prove it because you're not doing a good enough job at keeping these statistics and in doing full investigations into that. Um, and on that note, they did find a very sympathetic audience in Parliament and, um, and, and within the, uh, the, the medical community. Given all that then, was the association pushing at an open door? There was evidence that the British people were worried about the safety of at least the pertussis vaccination, as seen by the remarkable drop-off in take-up for DTP. Yet almost paradoxically, there was also evidence that the British people had faith in vaccination as a concept, because there was only a small drop in the numbers taking the separate diphtheria and tetanus jabs, and polio didn't see anywhere near uh, as big a drop-off, even though polio had become a much less um, prominent disease. Um, by the end of the 1970s. Parliament was largely in favour of a compensation scheme and they appeared to be trying very carefully to, be, uh, to avoid being painted as anti-vaccination. Um, and campaigners were, were very clear that they weren't anti-vaccination, at least at this time, with um, Jack Ashley arguing in a letter to the Times that the government should de devote as much energy to promoting the crucial immunisation scheme uh, or at least the Secretary of State should devote as much energy to promoting the crucial immunisation scheme as he has to resisting the genuine appeals for action on such disturbing issues. Now, as, I, as I've already said, Fox uh, mentions in her autobiography that they had deliberately chosen to focus on pertussis as it was the one generating uh, the, most uh, the most controversy. But even if it was an open door, it took quite a long time for the legislative process to walk through it. The DHSS, with Ennals in charge, found it difficult to know how to respond. Now Ennals quite early on acknowledged that a compensation scheme was the way forward um, and a way to restore confidence by saying, we think that this risk is so low, we're willing to provide compensation in the, in the rare instances that this happens. Please, for the love of God, get your children vaccinated, <laughs> otherwise we're going to have uh, massive epidemics. But he wasn't confident enough to be able to say with certainty that this vaccine was absolutely 100% safe. Um, which of course no vaccination is. So he kind of passed the, um, he passed the problem off in two directions. Um, the compensation uh, element was passed, passed off to the Pearson Committee and the scientific side 
on the scientific side, he rejected the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation's recommendation that the government commit to a massive publicity campaign for DTP until they completed a full investigation into its safe, safety and efficacy. And this was eventually published in 1981 and pretty much absolved um, DTP from any blame, but did highlight the fact that, you know, sort of reiterated the fact that no vaccine is 100% safe because no medical procedure or anything in life is, but that the risk was so low um, as to be more than worth it um, to the individual and to um, society as a whole. Going back to the Pearson Committee, um, the justification for being able to push forward legislation came when correspondence was published between Pearson and Jim Callaghan showing that vaccination would be covered in the final Pearson report. Now again, the association, this is, this is from the Pearson report, again the association um, was credited with bringing this issue to public attention. And the point was made that most expert bodies acknowledge the moral case for vaccination, uh, including, as we see here, the, the BMA, the Royal College of Physicians, uh, the Royal College of Surgeons, uh, the British pharmaceutical uh, industry, and, and everywhere else. Um, it seemed to be that the, the, there, was no, there was no opposition to the moral case that compensation ought to be provided for the, for the few cases of vaccine damage, um, because the vaccination program was for um, the good of the collective, and this was a this was an argument which um, which we can sort of see and again sort of putting it into uh, massive inverted commas here, but the sort of the classic welfare state of the post-war kind of settlement. Um, the the justification for unemployment um, insurance, for example, was that there was a collective risk of unemployment, so that we all pay into the system, so that on the rare occasion where we do have unemployment, um, you can take out until you're able to get back on your feet. Um, it was also the justification for workmen's compensation in the late 20th century that um, there'd be a collective pool that the state would pay out from um, as a result of, of the, the collective risk um, taken by the working classes um, for the good of the national efficiency. You know, we need people to work, we need people to take these risks, uh, and therefore there will be a safety net for those people who take those risks and are most likely to be affected by um, those things when they go wrong. This is also the age of uh, health and safety, the health and safety report um, published in 1974. Um, and it was also, again, sort of tying into a lot of the, uh, a lot of the arguments that had been made for the extension of disability benefits again in the 1970s, was that, that you know, that the, there was, everybody had a sort of collective risk of disability and therefore there should be a collective um, safety net to sort of guard against that. Now, Pearson was published in March 1978, and the DHSS had seen the writing on the wall and had already been preparing legislation um, from at least 1977, at least formally they'd been preparing since early 1977. So they were quickly ready to introduce uh, legislation to the House. Uh, and their proposals um, gave payments of £10,000 to claimants who could show that, as a result of vaccination recommended by the government, that their child had become 80% or more disabled. This borrowed from the assessment criteria that were already being used in the industrial, in, uh, industrial injury benefits scheme and in war pensions. And with cross-party support, it went through actually very quickly. It was introduced on the 5th of February 1979, and it gained a, a ro the royal assent on, on the 22nd of March with no debate at all in the Houses of Parliament. Um, so clearly they'd, they'd made the right deals with the right people. Um, and the, there, was no, the, there really was no debate that some sort of compensation scheme ought to go through. Now, I've only really sort of skirted over a lot of the issues here, and uh, very obviously the campaign was far more, uh, far more detailed than this, and there were a number of uh, knock-on effects uh, from it. Um, for, for one thing, the fact that uh, the burden of proof was on 80% damage uh, meant that, uh, that very few people applied. Um, the association claimed very few people applied because they knew they weren't going to be able to get any compensation, um, where the authorities um, claimed that very few people applied because actually vaccine damage was nowhere near as common uh, as the association uh, had made out. Uh, the association also claimed that the uh, payments didn't go anywhere near far enough. 
um, while the government argued that given that they were already getting far more than other people who had equal need um, from the social security system, um, that perhaps they were um, overplaying their hand. But I want to end um, sort of th this uh, this paper really by focusing on some of the, the problematic parts of the campaign, at least from uh, from my uh, from my experience and from the, the sort of the disability angle that I've that I kind of came at this from originally. Uh, first, if there were people in the association who wanted to see the end to the max vaccination program, and there is some hint from Fox's uh, autobiography that. Um, she very much plays on the classic trope of we're not anti-vaccination, we're about educating parents, yet everything they produce is about the risks of vaccination and how dangerous it is, um, rather than giving a sort of like a balanced overview of the sort of the risks versus rewards. Um, so it, it is kind of difficult from her book to really sort of tease out where whether she's playing the political game and knowing that if she says she's anti-vaccination, she's not going to get any support, versus... Um, Obviously, in, in her in in her mind, protecting children from this this risk of, of vaccination. If the association wanted to see an end to the mass vaccination programs, their success over the nineteen seventies was actually somewhat counterproductive. Indeed, the epidemic of nineteen seventy eight seventy nine pretty much proved to many that regardless of the of the risks associated with it, vaccination worked. Dr. Tony Smith wrote a column in the Times in August nineteen seventy eight in which. He begrudgingly gave the association credit for exploiting the pertussis scare and bringing people's attention to the fact that, yes, vaccine, vaccination wasn't ever 100% safe. However, under the subtitle, One Certainty in Today's Epidemic is that Vaccination Works, he argued that only a small minority of doctors believed that the dangers of whooping cough vaccination outweighed its benefits and that the most newsworthy opinion is the maverick one. The doctor who believes that orthodox medical treatment of a particular condition is wrong. His views will be given an airing unless they are patently absurd. And he goes on in his column to argue that it was only ever a minority of, uh, of doctors that, uh, that claimed that uh, pertussis vaccination um, was dangerous. And actually their statistical basis for making those claims um, was nowhere near as, as rigorous as it ought to have been given the size of the scare and goes on to make the argument that uh, this is a reason why only experts should be involved in these sorts of medical debates because no matter how educated the lay person um, they'll you know you, you can't have a, a political debate over scientific fact which again is is one of the um, one of the arguments of the sort of anti anti vaccination movement uh, today um, Yes, if any of you want a good laugh, um, go on Facebook and join some of these um, anti-vaccination groups and some of the anti-anti-vaccination groups as well. Um, you will very, very quickly lose the will to live. Um, but in that short little period uh, early on, it's actually, it is actually quite funny to see, uh, to see these memes going around of uh, children being stabbed by massive needles and, and various, other, um, various other tropes which uh, go which really, I mean, they go back to the uh, to the uh, uh, the eighteenth century, let alone uh, the nineteenth. The other issue which fascinates me is the one over the relative priority given to specific groups of disabled people. When the thalidomide victims were given special treatment under the Heath government, disability campaigners were left frustrated that their core arguments about benefits based on need alone had been undermined after years of, as they saw it, progress with both major political parties. Interestingly, with vaccine damage, these organisations didn't engage with that issue. The, 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 the big um, disability organisations didn't engage with vaccine damage at all. The Disability Alliance, who had um, really been the group that had very closely focused on Pearson and on the committee, they'd submitted lots of evidence, they'd been in direct contact with Pearson on a number of occasions, sort of making their case and uh, talking about um, the, uh, the various um, implications of what they were talking about. Um, even they just don't mention vaccine damage at all, um, given that this was uh, very much framed as a disability issue, at least by the association and in the wording of the legislation. Um, it is actually quite interesting that Disability Alliance just don't, don't mention it at all and stay completely clear of it. Um, and part of that may have been 
either that they didn't care or that they didn't want to give undue prominence to uh, special cases. Uh, the government very, very deliberately called this the Vaccine Damage Payments Act and not Damage Compensation because they were adamant that they accepted absolutely no fault, partially because they didn't want to open themselves up to legal action from parents and partially because they didn't want to give an opening to other special interest groups. Um, Plaid Cymru and a number of Welsh Labour MPs, um, for example, were very, were very keen to press the claims of minors who had, contra who had contracted lung diseases. Um, and there's quite an extended uh, correspondence in the government files um, where civil servants advise ministers that they have to be very careful that they don't put themselves in a situation where they may be forced to pass other laws of this type um, for, other, um, for other interest groups. And Fox herself was very well aware of these issues. This is a letter that she sent to the Times uh, in 1981 at the point where she's arguing for an expansion of the scheme, both in terms of uh, lowering the qualification criteria in terms of from 80% downwards, and also in terms of providing a, a, a higher um, payout for those who were, um, for those who were damaged. Um, she argued that equal treatment would only be acceptable if the state could afford to pay all disabled people the amount they would be awarded in court following an accurate assessment of their needs. Her main argument being that, um, yes, it would be very nice if everybody was given the same amount of money, but given that we've got only a limited amount of money, um, we have to prioritise those who are most in need or most deserving. And her argument was that um, vaccine-damaged children uh, came under the most deserving category because of the legal um, the legal tradition in Britain of tort. Given that if you are damaged, if your property or your person is damaged by another person, um, you have the right to sue them um, for for recompense. That's the sort of the basis of of uh, good old fashioned uh, English justice. Um, she continued to press for expansion of the Va Vaccine Damage Payments Act during the 1980s, but she was frequently rebuffed by the DHSS and by Margaret Thatcher herself. Uh, indeed, if you go to the internal government correspondence from the 1980s, you can see that Norman Fowler and Margaret Thatcher get progressively more and more annoyed with this this woman who won't take no for an answer. Um, and, and in the end, Fowler has to write to Margaret Thatcher and go, look, you're going to have to reply to this woman because she's not listening to me. Um, and it will have to be a sort of a final, no, enough. This isn't going to happen. Um, and Thatcher very clearly makes the, makes the argument, no, we said in the 1979 manifesto that we were going to expand disability benefits once the economy allows, um, based, on the, based on need alone, and we want to provide um, equal support for all disabled people based on their needs, uh, not on how they got um, their, um, not on how they, they acquired their, um, their impairment, which was uh, in a way a sort of a conservative tactic to be able to go, well, you know, how long's a piece of string we can always make the argument that nobody's benefit should be raised because um, until the person at the bottom has got the same as you, we don't have to, uh, we don't have to improve it. But there was, there was also a genuine ideological commitment which was borne out by the campaigns of the disability organisations themselves. Um, and the Thatcher government knew that if they gave, even if they wanted to give any concessions to Rosemary Fox and her association, um, they would come under immediate attack um, from other disability organisations who, quite frankly, were probably more powerful um, than the association at that time. Right, I think I've taken enough of your time and um, gone on for quite a while. So I just want to end really by sort of telling you what I think is interesting and then you can tell me whether I'm right or not. Um, the, the, first, the, the first thing really is that it's, it's, this is obviously a very complex issue and while the association I think was very good at exploiting the scare over pertussis and, and, and made, made a very clear and convincing argument that in some ways had already been accepted um, and in other ways needed to sort of be drawn out and they were very good at drawing it out was this, this idea that um, compensation ought to be paid to the few victims of something which benefits the whole. Um, but if we want to establish how successful the association was, uh, that, that becomes quite difficult. Um, with the Act itself, it only provided a very modest payment and only to those considered most disabled as a result of vaccination. Uh, the government accepted no legal responsibility for, for what had happened to those children. Um, 
and the act itself was a, was a tool to restore confidence more than it was to discourage vaccination. Again, you know, ostensibly the association wasn't set up as an anti-vaccination um, movement, but it's very clear that there were members in there that were very sceptical about vaccination. And tied into that, we have to place the act very firmly in the 1970s. Um, the, the, financial concept, uh, the financial context uh, really means that there were very few people who were entitled and very, uh, very few people who actually received compensation. So it was affordable within the, uh, the restricted budgets at the time. Um, but it was, it was very much based on the various committees and legislative frameworks that had been established over the previous 10 years or so for disabled people. So th th there really is a question of whether the association was pushing against an open door or whether, to a large extent, they were even necessary. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, not entirely sure how to answer that question. Um, to return to the title of the piece, uh, How Safe is Safe? Um, that's also a very, a very interesting question because it was, it was very clear that as far as the British people were concerned in the 1970s, majority scientific opinion wasn't enough to convince everyone to, to get their child um, vaccinated with, with DTP. There were enough dissenting voices in the medical community, the voluntary sector and the press to sow seeds of doubt. And so there's all sorts of questions about risk and how people view risk when it's their own child versus the collective versus, um, versus their neighbours and the sort of the general British public health. Who takes responsibility for those risks and who takes those risks? It's, it's a very difficult, uh, very sort of thorny issue. Um, and finally, and something that I sort of touched on towards the end but haven't really gone into too much detail with, are, are there certain sections of the population who are more worthy of protection than others or where there is a, a higher standard that we need to hold those people to? That, that is to say, is there something about children and accidents involving children that means that we want to be even more safe with that group than we are with, say, another group? Was there something about children that elevated their profile above others? Um, was the debate over risk heightened because it largely affected children? Um, and does that add an extra moral or subjective dimension to this debate, forcing the government's hand and affecting the behaviour of parents and of the medical community? Um, and there I will leave it. Thank you very much. <laughs>